I'll go ahead and open our meeting uh, this the uh, July 17th 2019 and this is a council work session so I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order I'd like to recognize those that are in the audience uh, I see a number of individuals that I recognize and some of you were involved in the uh, the interviewing that had taken place for this study um, tonight we're going to we have a staff report uh, but I, I kind of want to set the tone just a little bit that the staff has given no recommendation at this time uh, this is going to be an informational workshop this evening and just giving general uh, direction for the completion of the uh, fiscal and uh, and um, recreation master plan and feasibility <coughs> study. So like most of our work sessions, this is a learning for uh, the council for uh, information that's going to be uh, utilized at a later time. And so with that being said, uh, I'll turn um, the introductions over to Susan to introduce the, the staff report and then uh, those that we have from the consulting firm with us. So Susan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilors, and welcome everybody to the Community Center. Let me try that again. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and welcome to the Community Center. It's exciting to be here tonight. Yeah. Uh, I'm Susan Muir. I'm the Parks and Rec Director, and I'm going to introduce the staff tonight and then give a little overview of the project in front of you tonight for discussion. So here at the table are the three managers in Parks and Rec that manage each of the facilities that were studied as part of the um, feasibility look at our recreation buildings. Ann Lane works primarily at the Senior Center and has a long history in Parks and Rec. Katie Noyd is here at the Community Center and many people see her running around and setting things up for us when we're having meetings in this building and she does a great job of it. And then Rob Porter is over at the Aquatic Center. So, uh, you know, we talk about at the City of McMinnville that we're really working managers. And I will say these folks do everything from facilities management to programming to staffing to they really do it all. And, and to be at this point in the process um, is a really exciting thing for all of us to be thinking about long term. Where are we going to go for recreation facilities for our community? Uh, for everybody in the room, we we have a web page set up, www.whatdoyouthinkmac.org. Uh, the staff report that has all of the findings and all of the information that the consultants are going to go through is linked there. It's also on the City Council's web page, but you can go there and find it pretty easily. And then we also put the PowerPoint that is going to be used tonight on there. And we will use that web page address just as a regular update for anything that happens on this project going forward. So um, there are stickers in the back, because we're Parks and Rec, we have stickers. There are stickers in the back with that web page address on it, so you can take one of those with you and then just check it periodically or use it to pick up on what we've done tonight. So as the mayor kicked off, this is a study. We're here to talk about the facilities as part of the budget discussions um, earlier in the year and even on the facilities piece that you looked at for all of the city facilities, I think it's 57 facilities were studied back in November, we recognized that there is a point of uh, discussion needing to happen in this community about the return on investment in maintaining our facilities. And particularly, this building and the Aquatic Center have faced some difficult challenges. And we have done every, everything we can as a city to keep those all of these facilities running and safe for our patrons, but it's now an opportunity for us to go, do we invest more in these facilities or do we look at something different? Uh, so as many of you know, when I look at things, I like to look at space a little differently. And so thinking about these buildings, I thought to kick this conversation off before um, I introduce our consultants. I, and I wanna do one more thing. Um, Janet Adams and Steve Ganser are also here. They're the other two Parks and Rec managers that don't necessarily oversee facilities. They actually do oversee facilities, but they're outdoor facilities or school facilities and programs. So they're here today and have been very involved in this program. So it's been a good team on the city side of things. Um, back to the space. I always like to think of space differently. And, and having been here now for two years, coming into this building, I had quite a different perspective on the spaces that we use for our rec programming. And when you start to dive into the details about the facilities, you know we have a 55,000 square foot facility here that we're in. We have a 28,000 square foot facility over at the Aquatic Center. 
and we have a 10,000 square foot facility at the senior center. So we have about 93,000 square feet of indoor space that we're using in McMinnville for recreation uses and recreation programming. And when I think about how big that space is, that's a lot of space for us to be able to try and do things. Um, and so I was thinking, okay, we got about 100,000 square feet of space. Um, that is almost the size of a full Manhattan city block. We could fit one and a half white houses in the recreation facility square footage that we have. We could fit two homes of Bill Gates in our recreation <laughs> facilities. Um, and then when I start to think about recreation facilities and think about 100,000 square feet, and these are all kind of rough numbers, and these don't include the HVAC, and these don't include the janitorial closets, but just to get an idea of space and what we're dealing with, you all know what this facility looks like. Um, in 100,000 square feet, we could put a whole football field plus another three quarters of a football field. Uh, we could put six hockey rinks or six or indoor soccer fields. We could put 18 basketball courts or 18 futsal courts, which is something that we get asked about. We could put 40 tennis courts. We could put over 100 pickleball courts. We could put seven Olympic-sized swimming pools and we could put over 600 parking spaces. So that's a really different way of thinking about the space that we have, and a lot of our ideas about the space and the recreation programs comes from our identity with these facilities. So I just wanted to throw those kinds of open-ended, you know, thinking about things creatively and openly is what, what do we need to do for our community for the next 20 or 30 years for recreational space? We have a lot of opportunity, we have a lot of space right now, we have a lot of programming happening, and we've got a great list from our community that they told us through the surveying process of what they'd like us to see. So I'm gonna turn it over to our consultant team um, and Ken Ballard who can introduce the rest of the team to you so that you can hear what their findings have been at this first phase of the study. Um, they're gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then throw it open to a discussion where we're interested to hear from you all. So I'll kick it over to Ken. Thank you, Susan. Well, good evening, Mayor and members of Council and uh, everybody else who's here this evening. Um, again, my name is Ken Ballard. I'm with uh, Ballard King & Associates. We're a recreation planning firm, and we're the lead firm on this project, and I'm the project manager. And uh, as Susan indicated, we're going to kind of go through the first half of this uh, project of where we are this evening and where we stand. And uh, it really is an important time to get your input in terms of the direction that we're heading. Up to this point, we've really been gathering information and uh, gathering background materials, and now we're ready to kind of start talking about uh, what it possibly means. Before we do that, I'd like to have the rest of the uh, team introduce themselves and, and kind of what their roles are in the project. You'll be hearing from all three of us here through this presentation. Cindy? Thank you again. I'm Cindy Mendoza. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation out of MIG. We're a planning and design firm that specializes in part in parks and recreation services. So we do this type of planning all around the country for both indoor and outdoor facilities. Um, one of the areas especially we bring is in public engagement and outreach to make sure that we understand the community's priorities and use those to prioritize whatever the recommendations are. So that's my role here on this project. I'm Jim Cavillage, a partner at Opsis Architecture. We're based in Portland, and we work on community center projects throughout the uh, Northwest, many of those in collaboration with Ken, also uh, Cindy. And um, our focus uh, for this part of the study has been the physical assessment of the three facilities, uh, not only uh, in terms of code and, and the uh, uh, the physicality of the building, but also the functionality of how these uh, uh, facilities are actually functioning. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll kind of start through the uh, presentation. So let's talk a bit about it. These are the kind of the goals that were established for the project, and these are kind of coming out of the RFP that was put out for this process. And it um, really was kind of looking at the physical condition or the assessment of each of the three centers. Um, you know, certainly the community center that we're sitting in, the aquatic center, and also the senior center. Out of this was also one of the main goals and 
I mean, areas of focus is really kind of developing a recreation program plan. What direction is the city going to go into? What's the uh, needs of the community? And really, there's two pieces to that. The first one we're pretty much done with this evening, which is the public engagement process. And that really then becomes the driver for what does this mean in terms of programs? And what is that, how does that impact facilities that need to be uh, either modified or new as we move forward? Other important pieces that we're starting to develop but will become more clear as we move into the next section is funding. How do we possibly look at funding both the capital aspect of any uh, improvements or new facilities as well as the operational implications of that. A partnership assessment, which we're also partly the way through right now, who could be possible partners on this project. And in that particular case, we look at what we consider equity partners, ones that may be bringing possible resources to the table for the projects themselves. And then ultimately, whatever's recommended coming out of this, how does the operations of whatever is recommended happen? What are the restaffing requirements? Ultimately, what are the cost aspects of that from an operations perspective? And a really important piece of the, the process is really implementation. So how does this occur? Where do you start? Uh, what's kind of the roadmap moving forward? So that, that was kind of our, our task. Um, and here's what's been completed up to this point, and this is what we're going to spend our time on this evening. And really, it, the first part of it is the uh, facilities assessment piece, an analysis of kind of the recreation programs and where they currently stand, and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time on the public engagement process, uh, the online survey, the focus group, and the key leader interviews. And a lot of you in this room, both at the table and in the audience, were part of uh, of this process, especially the focus group and key leader interviews. So with that in mind, let's, uh, uh, I'm gonna turn it over here. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Different. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the physical uh, conditions of the building. And again, I'm gonna turn that uh, over to Jim who really uh, led that effort. So we'd like to uh, start with the building we're in the uh, community center. Um, it was built in 1924, as you know, and was originally designed as an armory, so not for this particular purpose. Renovated in 1980. Uh, we started by looking at the uh, condition assessment report from 2018, which uh, identified uh, the exterior of the building needing significant upgrades. Uh, MEP systems are all really on their last legs and really should be replaced. So uh, a lot to do uh, just with the uh, infrastructure of the building needs to be upgraded. In terms of just the functionality, uh, lack of ADA access throughout the facility, um, we really noted the uh, circuitous uh, circulation patterns, which are not only disorienting and uh, at times actually feel somewhat unsafe. They, uh, just the nature of it means that there's a lack of supervision for what's going on. Um, the downstairs uh, restrooms and locker rooms feel uh, remote, um, a lack of uh, supervision there as well, and, and they are used for uh, a public shower facility as well, which makes it even more challenging with some of the youth programs down there. Um, the front desk, uh, the lack of kind of controlled access and security. I, I got in the building without anyone asking me anything, so that's a, a sign. <laughs> but you know, it's just challenging with the stairs right away that lead up and down. Typically, you would go uh, through a supervision control point before having that type of access. Uh, it, and along with that, the administrative offices are dispersed, so lack of continuity between the staff. Um, that's also true of the fitness spaces on multiple levels. Uh, aspect ratio and proportion of the rooms aren't what you would build today. Uh, and that also um, is somewhat reflect the room we're in. Uh, sometimes there's columns in the rooms and uh, other obstacles that you uh, kind of limit the usability of the space, uh, child watch being on a lower level, again, kind of a challenge, and uh, a lack of supervision there. Um, 
the gym, it's a good size gym, um, but um, we also know that it's uh, also a theatrical performance space, which limits its availability. Um, kind of alluded to the multi-purpose rooms, I mean the low ceilings, that uh, gymnastic space and across the board, um, they're just not designed for that, the type of use that they're being used for. Um, and then the, uh, the parking uh, adjacent to the building, uh, there, there is uh, parking, but, uh, and also the parking structure across the street, but these types of facilities usually have a, a fairly generous drop-off zone, which is kind of a big deal when parents are picking up their kids and there's vans or even buses sometimes that come to these facilities and that's not really uh, something that is uh, really addressed with the current location. Um, so obviously a, a big list of concerns about, you know, do you move forward? Uh, oh, thank you, Ken. Um, with renovating a facility like this or new construction. So uh, kind of hard to read. It's in small print down there, but uh, we ran some initial just cost range of numbers for renovation as well as new construction. Um, we're looking at for renovation, probably 450 to $500 a square foot, um, which puts you in the range for total project costs of a uh, 32 to 35 million dollars thereabouts. Uh, new construction isn't really that much more. Um, and you would end up with a facility that is uh, functionally uh, with an optimal layout. And so much of this building has corridors and circulations that you need to maintain and uh, just a lot of space that is just not being well used. So uh, at 500, to 550 a square foot, uh, we're looking at about a 35 to 39 million dollar project. The delta between renovation and new isn't that significant. Uh, where we would really, for all the reasons I've said, you know, would recommend that this building is replaced and relocated somewhere else. Uh, another key thing, yeah. Jim, you may want to mention is the fact that. Uh, the, the numbers you'll see uh, in terms of cost factors are all 2019 dollars so they're you know you probably have to be accelerated out yeah there would be escalation looking out uh, at least a couple years or if not longer depending uh, when you're actually uh, passing a bond and then going through design which is about a year so it's at least several years out do we have a, a percentage increase Typically, that we look at uh, increased costs just to for inflation and cost of materials. Um, there is, uh, in fact, I was just talking to a contractor yesterday uh, about this. In the last three years, it's been significant. It's been twelve percent a year. So uh, we hope we hope that that doesn't continue. We feel like that's leveled out <coughs> somewhat, um, but uh, numbers are, are still quite high. You know, I think in the past you would typically think of a four or five percent escalation. It just hasn't been the case, and so much of it's actually market driven, where uh, a lot of the subs are very busy, and so their their pricing is quite high, and just availability uh, with the amount of work that's going on. It's not particularly slowing down either with the Intel's and a lot of the K through 12 work going on. And th this would be a, a large project that would. It would attract uh, major contractors for sure. Jim, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so this is assuming that you would build a new facility that's exactly the same square footage size as this facility, correct? Um, yeah, it's apples to apples um, in terms of square footage. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, if you were to build the exact size of facility, you would probably end up with a lot more usable program space. Right. <laughs> Is, uh, is a short story. You would have a larger fitness area, you know, uh, appropriately sized rooms and um, wider corridors where you want them or lobby areas in front of a community uh, meeting room, that type of thing. Yeah, because if you were going into a new facility, you right. evaluate, you know, what kind of square footage you Absolutely. actually need to, Absolutely. to serve the community. Yes. So this is, you know, order of magnitude. Right. It's rough order of magnitude, as Ken said. 
you also need to escalate out appropriately for starting construction. Okay. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, for frame of, ref yes. Frame, of frame of reference on your cost per square foot, what are you uh, mm -hmm. including in there? Is that just construction or does that be architecture fees as well? Mm, good point. So um, I just jumped over the construction costs and gave you the total project costs. So um, in, in the chart that you have uh, maybe in front of you, uh, there's construction costs, which is the second uh, column, and then uh, total project costs. Uh, we're using a general rule of thumb standard, which is another 30% for the indirect construction costs. That includes uh, architectural engineering fees, permitting uh, contingencies that the owner would carry, both for construction and design. Uh, you might hire a project management group. There's legal fees. So uh, that 30%, it's, we've, we're seeing that number even creep up to 32%, but it's the other, you know, rough third of the project cost, and it's really important you uh, consider that. So. so that's in your total cost, total project it, cost range? Absolutely. Okay. That, yes, it is. So you'll, you'll see a significant difference. Uh, for instance, new construction, 19, uh, million, 19.6 million to 21 million, and then you look at the total project costs, it's 25.4 or up to 27.3. So that's that uh, 30%. <coughs> Copy. Okay. One of, the other, one of the other key things it, it was the way this was done was to give you kind of a comparison, apples to apples on what the difference is in cost between renovation and new construction. Uh, you know, if you decide to move forward in this direction, there's a lot of work that needs oh, to be true. done in terms of the facility. So you may end up with potentially even a smaller facility because we'll have more usable space if you're just replicating what's here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unknowns at this point. This is a pretty degree of magnitude and really designed to look at, so does it make sense to renovate or build new and to keep everything kind of equal, it was same square footage. And again, this is construction costs. So the thought would be if we didn't renovate this location, we could sell the land and possibly buy the land for the same price that we sold this land. So land is not a part of this calculation. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to aquatics. Yeah. In fact, I jumped to aquatics. I think the numbers I gave you, I apologize. So we'll jump to the uh, aquatics. Um, again, that the. the uh, the facility was originally built in the 1950s, but it had a major renovation in 1986. Um, it still has significant uh, deficiencies, uh, in particular with the uh, assessment in 2018, the exterior envelope in particular really needs uh, some tender loving care. Uh, it needs quite a bit of work. Um, there's also a lack of ADA accessibility up to the uh, second level administrative area and spectator seating balcony. Um, so providing elevator would be uh, a pretty important thing to do and consider. Uh, public lobby gathering area is very undersized. Uh, changing rooms and, and the locker rooms uh, have gang shower areas instead of individual showers. Uh, Think there might be a family changing room but you know it's it's very modest even without plumbing so it it's not how you would design a, an aquatic center today undersized uh, uh, the weight and fitness area you have to walk across the uh, the deck to get to it which is a challenge and just you know making do but uh, very small um, and obviously if one were to combine an aquatics with a, a dry land community center uh, you wouldn't be duplicating those functions. Um, the staff area is also uh, dispersed. Uh, you know, the break room and changing areas are, are, are challenging. The security systems are poor, and uh, uh, the public toilets, restrooms uh, are kind of lack uh, a level of security too, especially the proximity of the park and transient population coming and using those facilities, which have kind of created also some safety issues as well in that particular location. Another bullet here that didn't put down but is important is really the lack of parking in that area and the impact on the adjoining neighborhood. Um, 
You can see the uh, costs below. Uh, we did a comparison of renovation to new construction. Uh, the cost differential isn't so great that uh, we would recommend uh, considering new construction and replacement of the facility for uh, the reasons I've outlined. Um, again, you know, renovation, you know, 550 to 650 or 660 a square foot and new 700 to 750. Um, and so when you compare the uh, total project costs, including all the indirect costs, it's between 20 and 20, almost 22 million compared to 25 and a half to 27.3. So, uh, move on to the uh, next building that we evaluated, which is the uh, Senior Center, which is a much newer facility. Uh, sits in a, a park setting that I, I think uh, is very fitting for that type of uh, building. I know it's also really well loved by the users of it. Um, we did notice some deficiencies. Uh, there was there's a desire to have uh, some fitness equipment and workout space, and um, there is a possibility to perhaps uh, expand the building out towards the park into what is now outdoor eating area <coughs> off the dining. Um, so there's there's the potential to do a modest uh, expansion of the building that could make it uh, address some of the functional desires and needs. Um, because it does have very few larger activity spaces and the changing kind of demographic of senior population, they're uh, more and more looking for activity spaces along with the more passive activity spaces. Mm -hmm. It does have this uh, kind of isolation at night in the park and people do kind of feel like at times there's a, a fishbowl quality. Um, the dining area is a general activity space and to get to some of the other rooms, you need to circulate through it. Question? Uh, I, one that is always booked. Woo! A question this semi non sequitur, but that always flies through my head when I think about the senior center. Mm -hmm. But I have a question on that. It just flew through my head when I have a microphone in front of me, so I'm going <laughs> to ask it. How late do activities go at the senior center currently? <clears throat> Rup. Mm -hmm. So our, our posted hours are 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday wow. through Thursday. And uh, we have scheduled and planned activities that go at least till 8 p.m. on two of the nights of the week. Okay. And then the other nights of the week? We close early if, if we don't have anything going on, but um, oftentimes we'll program uh, one off classes and programs during that time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, with the circulation that goes through the, uh, the larger activity space, it, it makes the uh, connection to the uh, smaller activity rooms challenging when there's an event going on in that space, especially if people are having uh, uh, eating and so forth. Um, the kitchen is adequately sized, uh, but the dining area could, could certainly be enlarged. It's very popular and uh, it would be ideal if it could hold up to 80 people versus currently 60. Um, the entry door isn't as visible as it should be from the uh, front desk and uh, to address some of the uh, fishbowl effect, exterior lighting uh, would be another more exterior lighting appropriately placed uh, would help that situation out, especially around the perimeter uh, in the park where it would uh, uh, reduce that fishbowl effect. Um, the center, you know, doesn't have the best three presence, but it's also, uh, I think, for, it's a destination for its population, and um, um, so perhaps not as big of a liability as it would be if it was uh, a full-blown community aquatic center. Um, but I think there is an overall desire that uh, that facility can serve a more diverse population, too, um, and, and uh, some of these improvements that have been discussed here would, would help out with that. Um, we did run some uh, some numbers here based upon renovation, maybe a, a kind of a modest addition, and felt that between 100 and 125 dollars, you could start to address the uh, deficiencies. So, you're really looking at jumping to the total project costs, perhaps 1.7 million to 2 million dollar investment to address some of those uh, needs. Um, 
Whereas if you were to build this facility new, it uh, would be a significantly larger investment of five to six million dollars. So our recommendation is to, uh, to renovate. Okay, that's kind of the physical assessment. We're gonna change gears a little bit and talk about recreation programs. This is just the first part of this, and this really is an analyzing what currently the city's providing uh, in existing programs. Uh, one of the key outcomes in the next steps, we'll be talking about where this goes in the future, but obviously tonight we're not prepared to talk about that yet. Uh, what we did is we kind of inventoried uh, what the city was doing in terms of programming, there's, there's a number of common categories that uh, most recreation agencies in the United States have programming in, in some form, and we've kind of listed those in that uh, graphic on the right side, and it kind of shows, uh, again, common areas of, of interest, and then kind of the areas of focus in terms of uh, the, the classification, age, youth, adult, uh, those types of things, and then we kind of listed some of the basic program offerings in, in those particular areas. And, you know, really quite honestly, you look at that and you have some programming in most every area, with maybe the exception of teens. And so, you know, that's certainly for a, a community of your size. And again, the benefit is that you do have facilities that allow you to be pretty comprehensive in that. But it, it, is, it is strong. We see large cities that oftentimes don't have this much of a diversity in terms of the programming areas. So when we kind of look at, uh, from an assessment standpoint of uh, the existing programs, you know, you certainly, again, provide a, a wide variety of programs. Uh, you know, you have pretty traditional uh, program offerings uh, that we see, but also included in that is you, you run a number of drop-in opportunities, whether it's in this building, certainly the aquatics facility has that, where you just kind of drop in and, and take part in, the, in swimming during lap swim or, or open recreational swimming time, and even certainly at the uh, senior center, those opportunities are there. And those are program opportunities, and we have to account for those in our allocation of, of hours and how the facility is used. There's also rental opportunities, and you do some social service programming, uh, especially in the senior center and, and this building as well. Again, I emphasize in this day and age, it's nearly impossible for an agency, whether they're in a smaller city or a very large city, to be able to provide all the needs that a community has. It's just simply not possible anymore. So, you know, oftentimes now it's really trying to determine where you want to be and what your focus wants to be moving forward and recognize that there's other providers that may have to uh, carry the, the water, so to speak, in certain areas. And that's normal. So I don't think we're advocating that you need to be doing everything. And certainly in that last graphic I showed you, doesn't mean that you have to be robust in every one of those categories. Um, again, one of the things that's clear is that your programming strengths, which we'll talk about in a minute, is really related to the types of facilities that you have available. And some of the limitations are, are due to the ones you don't have. And some of the facilities that you uh, have available don't really support some of the areas that Jim kind of talked about at gymnastics. Uh, you know, it is a very strong program in a, in a very poor space to really accommodate that program. Fitness, in this day and age, you, you do uh, pretty well with that, but really not set up to take that on in a bigger role. And I think one of the other key things is as we look at, at what you're doing programmatically is the realization that right now basically 30 percent of your program participants are coming from outside of the city so you are somewhat of a regional provider and it's important to realize that so we talk in big picture terms what do we see as your areas of program strengths and this is by not only the numbers of being served but also by the number of programming and the areas of emphasis certainly youth programs and that's everything from your after school uh, activities to other types of uh, programming that really focuses on youth. Part of that, but a little bit different just because of its orientation, is youth sports and really primarily uh, on the outdoor side, but you do pretty well even on the indoor. Aquatics, naturally with the pool and the size and magnitude of what you have, certainly an area of emphasis and it, it certainly should be with uh, what you have there. Seniors, again, with the senior center, that's another obvious area of focus. And then the self-directed opportunities where people can just come at their own time and do uh, recreational activities. That's another one with the kind of facilities that you have. 
What do we see in terms of weaknesses? And these are areas where you're not probably doing as much programming. Um, again, we'll be determining through this process whether you should be taking uh, and having more of an emphasis in this area, in these areas or not. And that's cultural arts, not a lot of strong programming in that. Educational programming, a lot of agencies just decide they're not going to do that type of thing. Uh, others have a pretty strong emphasis on that. Special needs, that's a tough one. Uh, oftentimes that requires partnering with other agencies and other providers to accomplish that. Outdoor recreation, which is uh, obviously not facilities driven. Uh, adult programming, and again, with your focus on youth, and a lot of agencies just don't have a strong focus on adults. Um, families now is a, a major area of emphasis, and that, that the term family can be interpreted in a number of ways, but it's really kind of an intergenerational approach, if you will. And then teens, which is always a challenge for any agency to do that. So that, that's kind of where you stand right now, and the direction that's going that we will recommend in the future is going to be directly related to what we've heard in terms of uh, the community input process. And so that'll be developed moving forward uh, basically from this point on. So now I want to turn it over to Cindy and she's going to talk about the public engagement process and what we learned out of that. Thank you. Before I get into the findings of the engagement process, I want to talk a bit about why public engagement matters so much. Um, we've heard about the technical analysis that was done here. It's really important to cross-check that with the impressions of the community. It's also really important to recognize that while we're looking at existing facilities and existing programs, when we're talking about new buildings, we're looking at 20 to 30 years into the future to identify what people want to be doing, not only now, but as we move forward. To make these buildings cost-effective, it's really important to understand what people want to be doing. And so for that reason, we had a very robust, multifaceted community engagement process to try to understand what the community desires and needs are for programming, for drop-in opportunities, for recreation activities. And with that in mind, that gives us a sense of, are these buildings even going to be effective to meet the needs desired by the community? If not, what are the community's impressions for how we move forward, whether we renovate or do something new? So those are the types of questions we ask, plus looking to understand potential partnerships, um, willingness to support new facilities and the like. I wanna applaud the city staff here did an amazing job in terms of reaching out to people and getting a high level of participation. As you can see from the current slide, there was really targeted to look at not only what community leaders and stakeholders wanted to see, but even what underrepresented groups, including low-income residents as well as Hispanic Latino residents would like to see moving forward. There was three main types of outreach and engagement activities. As you know, there was an online questionnaire. We're gonna highlight a lot of the findings from the questionnaire because it was completed by over 1,400 people. Um, that response shows a high interest in the types of facilities that we are talking about. But it really sets the context to understand what we heard from our key leaders, which included some of you all. I was honored to be able to talk to you about your hopes and dreams for these facilities and for the community but also when we talk to different focus group members to understand uh, what their desires are. It really sets the context to help us understand some of the findings that we'll talk about today. So first of all, uh, to share with you, when we looked at the online questionnaire and we asked people about how important certain facilities were to them, what we saw is that there is stronger representation <coughs> and interest in aquatics than in the community center or the senior center. That makes perfect sense to us, given that seniors are a smaller portion of the community than would use either a community center or an aquatic center. And also, as we noted, the community center doesn't have a strong variety of opportunities that you might see in a more full-fledged, multi-purpose recreation center. In communities that have a, uh, a broader recreation center, you will find that usually that response is almost equal, the interest in aquatics with the interest in the community center. We wanted to understand what people felt, uh, again, was most important to them in terms of indoor activities. And what's interesting when we looked at this list is that we knew there was an interest in active recreation space, so sports and fitness. 
we knew there would be an interest in aquatics, which is number one on the list. The surprise is that in the top five, two of those elements are around art. So cultural arts, fine arts, uh, creating art programs. So what we're seeing is a broader interest in different types of opportunities than the ones that exist now. We also wanted to find out who needed more or better services, expanded programs or different types of opportunities. And the first thing I want to say is you're only looking at part of the results here. We cropped it so that you're only seeing the top findings from each. What is the biggest surprise here is that all groups that were noted on this list, 28% or more of the survey respondents had indicated that those people all need more or better services. So first of all, that's huge. That basically says everybody needs an opportunity to do something. The second thing is that the top responses, for the most part, dealt with youth, looking at youth programs or even multi-generational activities. Uh, again, that coincides with what Ken is saying about your strength being in youth programming, but the community telling us they would still like to see more opportunities for youth. We also wanted to understand what were priority activities for the entire community, just to cross-check what we were hearing in terms of spaces and facilities. And what we found here are, again, interest in youth programming, interest in active recreation, and interest in arts. So number one, after-school programming, two, sports, three, music concerts, cultural and historical events, and four, looking at youth summer camps. So again, those priorities emerge consistently across questions. Well, what about seniors in particular? When we ask specifically about senior needs and the top <coughs> priority needs, what was really interesting is that the first one, the social and support programs, are things that the existing senior center does very well. But when we look at the next two top priorities that are important to provide for seniors and older adults, we found there was a strong interest in aquatics, including water fitness and water therapy, uh, but also fitness classes. Those are the types of programs clearly not going to be met in your senior center, but that are really consistent with what we're seeing across the nation, and that is this trend of <coughs> older adults and seniors staying active longer and preferring to recreate not in a designated senior center, but in a multi-generational facility so they can be there with family, friends, and engage in a variety of opportunities. Again, we were cross-checking a variety of ways to understand not only what the program needs were, but also what types of spaces were needed in particular. And what we found is that there was a lot of interest in space for sports, fitness and exercise, youth camps and after-school programs, and a lot of interest in gymnasiums in particular. And why that's interesting is because when you think of the gymnasium here, um, it is also very strongly used as a social space because you don't have a large event gathering space in this community, so it's often reserved out. So it's not necessarily programmed only for sports and activities. So this represents a shift if we start to think of gymnasiums more in terms of active recreation space and some different type of space more so for events. An earlier table that I showed you uh, really indicated what the top priorities were in terms of important recreation activities. I want to share with you the bottom choices that were merged as well because those tell us something about community priorities too. And what we found is that the least important needs for space included rental space, whether it was for large events or smaller groups. Um, not necessarily a focus on meeting room space, not necessarily a focus on social space, but again, really emphasizing active recreation, sports fitness, and arts in particular instead. So what does that mean for a new facility versus an existing facility? When you look at the question that we ask people, the results are really minimal in terms of the difference that we see. In other words, almost as many people said, look for a new type of building or construct a new multi-generational, multi-use building, as they said, renovate facilities. But the really important thing to understand about this question is in terms of, of survey terminology, we call this on the natural. What this means is that we didn't give people any information with regards to really the, the condition of these facilities. We said, you know, there was this asset management study. It indicated there were some issues. We want to know what you think. 
So without them understanding what the issues were or what the costs are to renovate versus build a new facility, people do have a tendency to respond in the notion of let's take care of what we have. It's kind of a, a gut instinct that usually is the top response on any survey that comes first above all priorities is take care of what we have. So when we look at the fact that more people had indicated that we really need to be considering a multi-use building at this point, that tells me that as you educate the community about what the choices are and provide more information for effective decision making, more and more people will understand that the existing facilities are really not going to work for where they want to be in the future. We asked a variety of questions about location. What we found is that there's no uh, uh, the, there are mixed opinions about the location and there's no real consensus on how to move forward. Again, with the notion if we're keeping existing facilities, we should maintain them in the current location. That came up as a strong answer. But on the flip side, there's also one that said don't locate new buildings close to the center of McMinnville, which is where the existing facilities are. So again, I think it really depends on how things move forward. Stakeholders focus groups made it clear that we need to find the best space for the type of facility that's desired, also working with potential partners to make that decision. This didn't come out of the survey, but I just wanted to point out that we heard from stakeholders and focus group members, key leaders, very strongly that these facilities are really key to the community's identity and future. There's a desire for a stronger hub for this community. There's an understanding that growth is changing, that different types of residents will be coming to town over the next 30 years, and that new opportunities are needed to serve those. There's also a potential economic benefit or economic impacts associated with these facilities, um, not only bringing in people from immediately outside of town, but tourists who are coming to the community and also opportunities to attract new employees and businesses by providing more opportunities for them through recreation and the arts. There's also strong implications for the broader community as well that I just want to highlight. A lot of the conversations that we had were about making sure that we are serving all residents, which includes some of the lower income residents as well. Uh, many stakeholders mentioned that we need to consider um, the housing situation here, and as well as child care, for example, and how potentially we can address some of these needs by providing support through services associated with the recreation center. We also found that there was a really strong emphasis on community health, therapeutic recreation, and in conjunction with partnerships, opportunities to involve students in looking at uh, health and wellness opportunities in association with their degrees as they move forward. And that kind of leads us into this potential for partnerships. What we found is that um, in talking to a, a variety of potential partners, that most were agreeable to some type of venture moving forward. Certainly Chemeketa Community College and Linfield College want to see more opportunities for students and see opportunities to be involved in some way. Same thing with the school district, who really is looking in the best interest of students across the community and really appreciates the role that arts, sports, fitness all play in supporting academic achievement. We also talked to the See You Later Foundation, who, as you all know, is very interested in seeing some type of a community facility move forward and would also be willing to partner. We heard a couple of other partnerships come up just to call attention to them. Most people noted that there's a conversation around a convention center, but didn't really see that as a good fit here, recognizing that the convention center meeting room uses would take over the facility when a convention was in town, and that's not the type of facility that was really desired. And we all know that there's a, a larger space associated with Evergreen. Again, that didn't seem to be a really good fit operationally with what a lot of the key leaders wanted to see out of this facility. Very quickly, just wanted to acknowledge that we know that there will be a conversation with the community moving forward. So we felt it was important to start to capture some of the, the values that we were hearing associated with these new facilities moving forward, as well as the vision that people have. So this slide just is a reminder that having safe places to play and active recreation, making sure the facility is accessible, affordable, diverse, uh, high quality, 
inclusive inviting, multi-generational and open year round are things that we heard very strongly across all the outreach activities. We have a few questions up here that we don't necessarily want to address today, but we want you to recognize these are the types of questions that we are mulling over as a team and with city staff as we identify how to move forward. We're talking about who is the target market here, recognizing that these facilities not only serve city residents, but they also serve people from the surrounding region. We're talking about the types of programs and services that the facilities need to provide based on what we heard from the community. We're talking about the importance of the site, recognizing that some of the conversations were about opportunities for indoor-outdoor programming and how important site the location is in terms of facility access. We also were talking about the role that the city could or should play in terms of providing the facility, whether it needs to be the owner and operator or whether there is some type of partnership there to consider in moving forward that is most cost effective and most beneficial to the community. And finally, we've been, of course, talking about the level of financial commitment that would be needed in terms of moving forward and whether we really are looking at the lowest cost alternative or whether we're looking at potentially a larger investment supported by voters, supported by equity partners that again set the stage for where you want to be in five years, 10 years, and even 20 and 30 years into the future. Okay, so that's kind of where we are um, in terms of this kind of first half of the study. Before we start talking about moving forward and possible scenarios, Mayor or Council, any questions on anything that we presented that we need to clarify for you before we start talking about what possible implications may be? So let's uh, open up for questions of Council or uh, thoughts at this particular time. Zach? Uh, I, I already interrupted the process to ask my questions and I have no additional questions at this time. Thank you. Any other comments? I know with the. Uh, Excuse me, Mayor. Go ahead. Adam had some comments. Adam. Oof. I know we're at the. Is that on? No. Yeah. Um, I know we're at the thirty thousand foot level as far as costs go and whatnot, but we were talking round percentages, and I was curious in your experience what we could look at as far as cost savings, of, if there is any at all, combining a community center and an aquatic center into one, versus having two independent. Um, I'll let Jim respond to that a little bit, but there, there's absolutely, there's two cost savings. One of them's on the, the capital side, and there's absolutely an operational cost savings, plus, I think, additional revenue opportunities for across marketing potential. So it is real. It's real on both ends, and I'll let Jim talk a little bit about the capital implications. Yes, in terms of construction, there would be efficiencies of having uh, one combined building, um, uh, both in terms of the site, shared parking that could happen, uh, you know, less access points, the overall site development would be less. The, uh, the building envelope uh, would be significantly less uh, when you think of just the geometry of two separate rectangles versus combining those two forms together. It uh, creates a, a lot of uh, efficiency and cost savings just on the exterior skin of the building. Internally, uh, um, there's opportunity to get efficiencies with you know, public restrooms and some of the lobby area that can be shared. Uh, from a staffing standpoint, I'm jumping into Ken's territory, but uh, uh, reducing the, the amount of supervision, you can have one point of access uh, versus if they're two separate buildings, you're going to have to uh, have two staff independently doing basically the same role. So um, I'll, let, I'll let you continue. And, and going back to Jim, just one question yeah. I have. Is, are there any examples of communities that have done that combined uh, aquatic community uh, and in some instances yeah. I'd even say library services? Yeah. Uh, well, there, <clears throat> one that comes to mind right now uh, uh, that we did uh, a number of years back is the Furstenberg Community Center in Vancouver, Washington. Probably it's worth a little field trip if you haven't been there. Um, it's a combined 
community center, aquatic center. One of the uh, real draws, uh, I'm probably taking uh, Kim's thunder, is uh, in terms of selling passes and getting a full immersion of the family and serving everyone's need, uh, to be able to combine those together is is really amazing for your community, especially people's lives are you know busier than ever, and the travel time to drop your kids off for swim lessons and take your other kids over for basketball camp, whatever you know. It, it, dad wants to play, you know, uh, workout or play basketball. You know, it's it, it, the whole family can go there together. It's quality time. And a library actually fits nicely into that package. Uh, at Furstenberg, uh, we did an addition, which is the Cascade Park Library, a 20,000 square foot library that actually physically joins the uh, community center. Uh, we're in the process of, of planning this right now um, uh, in the Oak Lodge uh, neighborhood, Milwaukee area, um, of bringing together community center and library. So uh, uh, there are other examples around, but uh, certainly bringing those civic functions together, really creating a civic uh, campus is uh, a really exciting proposition. Thank you, Jim. One of the things I'll say is, uh, as a firm, we work nationwide. We, we work in really 49 states, so we, we see a lot of things nationally. One of the things that's pretty unusual about the Pacific Northwest is you guys have a history of doing a lot of standalone aquatic facilities, and quite honestly, you go most other places in the country, and that just is not done. And partly because of the cost implications and the you know, kind of the it's just a single function type of a usage. So you rarely see that other places in the country. So they build aquatic facilities with other recreation, just kind of like we're potentially talking about. And the library issues come up, other areas, especially in the Midwest, that have done either libraries on the same site in separate buildings as a campus, or literally integrated them physically into uh, the building where you walk in a main entry and, and you know, recreation center to the right, and library to the left. So, you know, these are, have done well, and we track this stuff, and uh, we know uh, in terms of um, community satisfaction, user, aspects of that. We know in one community in the St. Louis area where their circulation in their library went up something 30 something percent when they uh, brought that into their recreation facility. Mm -hmm. So we know those are have been viable options for, for communities. And Mayor, if I can just add on that, one of the things that I would expect as we look at this longer term study of how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be as a community, it would be a field trip with um, mm -hmm. tours and talking to you peers at other facilities. So if, if you wanted to do that sooner rather than later, we could absolutely set something like that up. Well, you know, I travel a, a bit throughout the state and I'll, I'll turn to Jeff. I know that the library is in conjunction with the city uh, offices and it, it flowed very nicely. A lot of community rooms Rooms that seem to be being really worked well in Springfield you know we've seen just other communities and it, they seem to be a result of, of the timing so I, I haven't exactly. seen where everything's brought together but I, I've seen where things have uh, been brought together in in um, specific ways that could show if we're starting from scratch you know we could create something that is not only uh, phenomenal for the community, but then it can be a source of revenue if you do it right. I, I concur with that. I think all of us up here would. Yeah. I do have a question. Uh, traditionally, the swimming facilities frequently are not money makers. I mean, no. in a situation like this, could we actually break even combining a number of facilities? Uh, let's take it more from the approach you'll get closer to breaking okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 Hard to say at this point, uh, you know, nationally there's not that many facilities, even in the most perfect world, that could cover their cost of operation by revenues. Um, that may be a tall order depending upon what ultimately goes into the facility, but it certainly is going to improve your cost recovery level in terms of just from the revenue side as well as the cost side and especially from staffing and everything else it's just more of an economical approach okay thank you I like that. 
Um, you have an opportunity to have a national perspective on, on Parks and Rec. What's the trend line in terms of staffing and Parks and Rec programs around the country and particularly in the Northwest? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it maintaining? Well, it, I'll let Cindy somewhat respond to this as well. It, it's still kind of in a lot of areas in a recovery mode from the recession where, I mean, there's places in the country that were either departments were sometimes even totally eliminated to slash 50% or more. I would say we've seen staffing come back from that. In some instances, they've come fully back and maybe even some on top of that. In other instances, they're still clawing their way back. Um, so it, it depends. It depends upon where where you are. I you say that you know Pacific Northwest wasn't generally as impacted as a lot of other areas of the country where it was pretty catastrophic. And so, uh, but it's been slowly coming back and slowly I see, we're seeing additional resources and, and uh, staffing coming to that. Um, I, you know, obviously that's in any facility that we're talking about, your one number one cost of operation is in staff. So we wanna try to do things that uh, maximize your opportunities and minimize your uh, staffing requirements and certainly you know right now you're you're running three facilities uh, and it just by the very nature there that's more costly from an operational standpoint to do. Uh, I guess I want to address this question from a slightly different viewpoint and that is it's not necessarily across the board one direct line in terms of staffing whether it's increasing decreasing or staying the same what we find is in communities that are interested in providing a higher quality of life and stronger community livability they will invest more in staffing because staffing are critical to provide the types of programs that are desired in a community one thing that's really important about recreation is uh, recreation programs do tend to be fee-based so there is a higher level of cost recovery often associated with kind of the facility fitness recreation program side that you see that is typically stronger than the cost recovery even on aquatics necessarily because of the investment in aquatics so to some extent an investment in staffing then revenue generation programs can actually increase revenues to help offset the cost of that staffing. So it's almost a, a shift that needs to be made in terms of a business model. As you commit to a facility like this, you commit to more staffing, you ensure that you have the right types of programming spaces to be able to generate the revenues to reinvest back into your community and their quality of life. Does that it help? It does, it does. And, and because this, is this idea of sustaining programs over time is of course what I'm concerned about. Um, have you found that there are certain types of programs that maybe across the board tend to pencil out better than better than others? Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. There's ones in terms of revenue versus operating expenses, uh, and quite honestly, those tend to be more uh, the more sure things are on the fitness wellness side, where we know those generate positive um, cash flow in many instances. Uh, aquatics, by its very nature, is difficult because of it has a higher level. I mean, we, we, by law, have to provide lifeguards that we don't have to do in basically any other amenity. And so it's, it's inherent cost is higher, and plus we're moving a lot of water and heating a lot of space. So it's not the best in terms of pure cost recovery. And that's why, as you made the comment, by putting it with other amenities, does that help? Absolutely. So yes, we actually go through an exercise that we kind of identify where you're, from a cost center perspective, where you can generate your highest return on dollar um, obviously depends upon what your concerns on and what your motivation is in terms of the service aspect versus the financial I'll be honest we go to some communities now they're saying if you cannot pencil this out on a zero cost operationally this is not going anywhere that's a really tall order and a lot of times we're saying go, you can't get there by either what you're wanting to do or the community dynamics in terms of size and income levels. So, you know, some projects just don't move forward. Can, can I understand? I want to make sure I understand your terminology. When you say zero cost, you mean? Operational. So you mean no no money coming out of a taxpayer budget, for, or do you mean? For no, operations. Or do you mean no money paid for the service? No, I'm talking about money paid for the service. Oh, okay. no, no net cost to, to the consumer. Tax, to, to, the, to the tax 
tax side of it. Okay. And operation. Again, when any of these discussions we're having is all setting aside any debt service, and we don't even go there yeah, in I get terms that. of that. Um, so, yes, it's all operation, but there are some facilities that are basically saying it has to, if it's costing a million dollars a year to operate, then it needs to be generating a million dollars in revenue to happen. Now, there's only literally a few places in the country that can do that. It says you, you have to do certain things, you have to do it in a certain way, and quite honestly, it says you can't do other things or you can't get there. But uh, that, that's when you're saying we're, we're driven by costs, not by service. And that's a whole different animal. Um, certainly not advocating that. But that's all over the page there nationally now, what that is. Thank you. So I'd ask Susan a question, if my memory's correct. Do we have somewhere in the neighborhood of a 75% cost recovery on our programs in REC? You're stealing my thunder a little bit for next week's work okay. session yeah. because we're going to be talking about the parks and rec fees as part of that. Um, generally, we have about 50%, and then now we're using the new cost model that you all heard about during the planning and building um, study where we're doing some indirect, applying some indirect costs to that. So we're going to report those findings out to you next week. But we have always had some informal targets. Sure. Um, and, and we'll talk a lot about okay, that next week. Okay, good. Yeah. But I mean, that fits into the discussion we're having Absolutely. right now. And when I look at facilities, that ought to be tax-based. And then it's programs running and the efficiencies that we might be able to bring together in a combined um, scenario. You know, I, I, I say in McMindo, and I've always said this, that our uh, level of volunteerism is phenomenal. You know, when we talk about 1,300 uh, volunteers, right. uh, primarily it's in recreation of soccer, baseball, uh, some of the other types of things, the senior programs, the libraries. I don't find cities even much larger than uh, than us that have that kind of volunteer base. And so I applaud this community. And I think it's very obvious as you had an opportunity to talk to people, the connectedness of this community wanting to give back in a meaningful way. So. Sorry, Scott. With your permission, I'll move forward and kind of, and it's kind of a good segue from where, where the discussion's gone here is, so, in order for us to kind of move to the second half of our work, we, we kind of want to talk about some possible directions in big picture terms. And ultimately, we're looking for your blessing that says, yeah, we think one of these is appropriate or some variation of one of these is appropriate for us to take forward as a general sense. So we have basically three scenarios for you. The first one's what we call status quo. And this one, First of all, let me say, we don't have an option that's, that's do nothing. And we don't feel that's even realistic. Uh, by doing nothing, you're basically saying uh, our future, we're on a downward spiral and at some point, uh, especially for uh, this building and the other. You're in the aquatic center, you're potentially looking at having to either do catastrophic uh, you know, repairs or whatever. So we didn't even bring that one forward. So the first one's really, when we stay status quo, that means we're not really doing any significant new things, no new facilities. We're really talking about improving what you have, but your existing three facilities are, are, are basically remain the same. You, you don't get a lot of really new programming opportunities because all we're gonna do is kind of just keep what you got going, keep the, uh, it moving along. The pros of this as well, it probably has the least financial impact. It's going to be significant, even some of the things that Jim was showing you. I mean, this is not a little dollar amount. This is a huge number. Um, and you're going to be able to maintain what you're currently doing, which is the good news. You don't lose anything by, by this. The con side of this is you're kind of kicking the can down the road. We've, we've invested some money in this. Well, yeah. And, and you're not... You're not making really uh, any long-term solutions. You're you're kind of and capacity. yeah no no real capacity changes. Little growth in the recreation programs, as we said. You 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 know you still have kind of what you have. Um, you still operate out of three facilities. Don't probably bring in any key partners because nothing's really changed in the dynamics of this. A lot of your safety security issues remain. So we're really talking about basic life safety issues, but not really changing any of the configuration of these spaces and just keeping things moving. So that's the first scenario. Um, the second one is kind of a combination of new and old. 
Um, and it kind of goes along the lines of what Jim showed you earlier. Uh, we would replace the community center and the aquatic center, and we put those into one facility. Um, out of that, then, obviously, now there's the opportunity to expand programs and services and improve upon them. Uh, you know, we, you get two new facilities. You become, have operational efficiency that's getting better. Um, you know, we, we keep the, the um, senior center uh, where it is right now, so it's not involved with this, really, at this point in terms of being integrated into this. What the new facility is, as it relates to the community center and the aquatic center, there's opportunities now for possible partners. Um, the cons are, okay, it's got a much higher capital cost than the first one, but the beneficial side of it is it remains pretty much the same. In, in terms of, uh, I should say, the senior center remains pretty much the same, uh, but the other opportunities are much, much higher. Site's an issue, as we have notified. So, okay, we commit to this. Where in the world does this go? And it's certainly a big issue. I mean, one of the things is, I mean, uh, Susan identified we've got a big allocation of square footage. So anything that we do is going to be a big facility, and all the things that go with it, parking and everything else, it, it, it requires a pretty big, uh, you know, piece of ground to do that. Again, possibility to bring partners for absolutely in this kind of a, an effort. Can, can I ask one question, to Absolutely. Jim, from a perspective of, you know, sometimes in a new facility, building up mm. is more efficient and cost efficient. Is that the case? Or these kinds of facilities, is it the best to have them all on ground level? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's, your, what's your thought there? Mm -hmm. um, well, going vertical usually has to do with um, limited land or the cost of land. I mean, for instance, uh, Portland State University built a, a vertical student recreation center. We've, you know, we've worked on those types of projects as well. Um, I think oftentimes what we see more often is perhaps a two-story building. Um, and the reason for that is uh, walk, jog tracks uh, are, are very popular and, and cost effective if they go inside a gymnasium space. They can go outside a gym as well, but once you uh, have a walk jog track you have an elevator you need two stairs and then you want to start to uh, combine a fitness center and multi-purpose rooms and then there's some real synergy of an active space it's also uh, all those functions uh, are accessed through having uh, a pain uh, or having a pass to go in to the recreation zone so simple answer is you know I think a, a two-story facility has some real merit and what it means is you know you're not sprawling the facility out so you've got opportunity for more uh, more parking or courtyards or outdoor amenities uh, depending on what the available land is um, good I, I was just thinking of um, uh, the facility at Western Oregon University yeah. that is a two-story right. mm -hmm. and they've really utilized that yeah. space and I think they've had some old right. space that they built new around yeah. I think it's the swimming pool and some yeah. of those basketball courts right. are old with the new in it yeah. and one point of entry very controlled yeah, uh, yeah. okay yeah oh by the way that's our project <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> we worked that out. <laughs> if you do go two stories, does that improve the seismic, the cost of the seismic type of thing? Because there will be seismic costs to, to mm -hmm. not put the building or just a one story make more sense for the seismic. Story. Yeah. Um, well, you can have a one story building that it sprawls, and depending on the geometry, you know, the more you have wings, then structural engineers like to create seismic joints and you know I, you know I, I think there's overall efficiency with with two story versus one story um, but you know it, it depends I, I'm not sure if it comes down to the structural aspect of it Just or not yourself. but uh, I mean good question um, yeah. okay okay so then the last version is kind of the all-in all new and that basically says we're going to take not only the seniors excuse me not only the community center and aquatic center but we're going to replace the senior center as well 
Um, obviously now that's kind of the ultimate, uh, you're, you're doing everything with all new facilities, you're getting your maximum operational efficiency, ability to really, uh, you know, with new facilities position these to have the best opportunities to uh, meet the needs of uh, programs and services in the future really, again, increases a little more the opportunity for partners. Con, highest capital cost for sure. Uh, somewhat of a negative just from a, a, sometimes a, a community aspect is everything's in one location. And so some people say, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, we don't have anything in our area of the community, that type of thing. And certainly the site issue only is kind of uh, more strong now. We just added more things to the, the puzzle here. and so. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the three scenarios. So I, I think ultimately what we're hoping from council is to get some direction on which one of these three uh, you would prefer us to explore as we move forward with uh, uh, some possible uh, recommendations. It doesn't necessarily have to be the three that we've shown up there. You're saying, well, I, I kind of like <laughs> a, a different option that we're not showing. That's fine too. So um, let's just open it up to council to have a discussion. Any any thoughts? Any further questions? Uh, we've got staff around the table, and if we need to call on them, feel free to do that. So I'll just open it up, and uh, let's just take the discussion further. I do have one question uh, with regards to the siting of the facilities. Do you have any guidance regarding what you've seen works exceptionally well in other communities? Uh, with regards to factors that we should think about, like obviously our community is is you know mixed on what they think. Yes, we want to like number one variable we want it close to downtown. Number one variable we want plenty of space. So what have you guys seen are the most important variables for choosing where to put a facility? Um, you know, usually when you get to the point of really trying to move forward, you you do a site analysis, you develop some criteria. Quite honestly, a lot of it's driven by what's available. So you sit there and say, ultimately, this is where we'd like to be, but if there's no land, or more importantly, one of the, usually one of the top criteria for most communities, it needs to be in public ownership because we don't want to have to take what's a limited amount of funding and apply that to purchasing the land. Now, in some instances, you have to end up doing it. But So some of it's already saying, well, the options are somewhat limited, so you may, some of your grander visions may say, okay, uh, you know, ideally we'd like to be here, but there's just not really any opportunity. And, and you know, so it's a little bit tougher in terms of what, what's really available. The other part of this, quite honestly, that Cindy alluded to is, who are your partners? And if some of your partners are gonna be what we call equity partners in that, that may have a lot to do with some of the site requirements. Jim? Yeah, those are all really good points. Uh, I think uh, a key criteria, if possible, is street appeal. Um, you know, being located on a major arterial, if possible. Uh, we've had projects where people keep driving by the building because there's kind of the display of activity and you can kind of sense what's going on. They eventually park and <laughs> walk in and check it out. So uh, I, um, I've also, you know, seeing examples of a community center, very robust, you know, full service center, but it's remotely located and, you know, kind of suffers because of that. So, um, and I think if there is other commercial development, uh, restaurants and, you know, other activities around that, um, feed, they can feed off of it. So it's mutually beneficial. So uh, versus being, isolated but you know we've also seen examples where community centers are part of uh, adjacent to a school or uh, a park where there's those other types of amenities which can be positive too if i can add to that uh, certainly in the the key leader interviews there was lots of conversations around what's needed in terms of siting a facility um, so in your information on uh, page C5 and C6, if you want to look at some of those findings, mm -hmm. they're there for you. 
Um, some of the things that were coming up is uh, certainly looking at bike and pedestrian access in terms of putting it in terms of uh, on the trail corridor, certainly the street appeal that was mentioned, parking, but also recognizing that parking needs are going to be changing in the future as we, again, you know, look at different scenarios on how cars are used. So making sure it has that adequate drop-off space as people are have, using rideshare programs and the like to get to different opportunities is important. Mm -hmm. Bus and transit access was certainly talked about and even mentioned in the context of you can't get to the far east side of the community right now on bus access. So looking at either changing that if a community center goes on the east side would be important. Um, also mm -hmm. looking at where low income residents are in the community to understand some of their challenges in terms of getting to facilities. There was even conversations around comparing where some of the new growth is happening in the community versus um, where some of the existing residents are and who's more likely of those to need a facility that is nearby. Certainly the equity partners came into play um, with both Chemeketa Community College and Linfield College mentioning that it would be nice to have something that is nearby for students, but not necessarily having to be immediately on campus. Um, so there was lots of things that came into play, including conversations around needing indoor, outdoor space and even city staff echo the importance of being able mm -hmm. to have programs for youth where while it may be indoors, if it's a day long camp, you need to be able to take them outside at some point. You can't really do that here. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you ever make uh, wood somewhere close like to an airport or something like that? We have a lot of airport land and <laughs> it just strikes me that it's a transportation hub for sure. and. Uh, there might be some value in putting it somewhere in that area. Yeah. I, I guess there's, there's just a lot of factors there that I would not necessarily be able to speak to. So it depends on circumstances around noise, chemicals, um, you know, certain things going on at the site that would obviously need to be vetted and investigated. Uh, I think all open space would probably be vetted in that regard to figure out where the, the best opportunities would be, knowing that we're going to need a sizable space. Um, one of the things that I should add is come up as Joe Dancer Park, uh, looking at an opportunity to provide a, a stronger connection to the river, the dilemma being that site floods. Um, but maybe there's an adjacent <laughs> space there that's on higher ground that also could be more appropriate. So I think there will be lots of sites, you know, such as, as you mentioned, potentially the airport, maybe even some sort of a, a county partnership considered or a land swap looking that they need additional facilities moving forward into the future. So everything's on the table immediately, but as you say, coming up with those criteria to make good decisions about sites will be important. You know, as we discuss some of these options, I, you know, for for me, you know, cost is the big thing, and and what that might look like. But you know, as we've gone through our facility study, and we know that uh, we have a critical need at the fire department that's going to need to be relocated. Could we look at a, a, a site that would include? Um, the fire department could we look at a site that might include library because that building needs to be reinforced I mean, or at least the library annex or library annex you know so we're ta we're talking about recreation today mm -hmm. but when you're building and putting uh, so much of uh, assets yeah, into dollars the dollars you know the more that we could put together because we're going to have to address the the facility side in the near future also so i just throw that out that we think strategically just today because we're talking about recreation there's other needs that we have and as we're building there's economies of scale of as as jim has indicated there's economies of scale of of maybe bringing things together yeah, certainly the li library came up multiple times as one that people are interested in seeing some type of a synergy there, but also maybe a, a civic hub of sorts. And I want to add that it's really smart to think in that context, because we also know that in terms of getting voters to approve bond measures, the, the broader the utility across the board for the community, the more likely the people are to support it. Absolutely. Sal? So you, in your um, recreational facilities assessment, had uh, pricing for replacing new construction or renovation for both the physical the community center and the aquatic center and the senior center 
and yet these these plans that we're discussing actually talk about combining some of those how do those affect the costs um, that you gave us um, the costs would would go down um, the uh, combining the two facilities together would would uh, mean less uh, engineering design fees uh, it's a combined project uh, the overall development costs as I was suggesting would also be less for the site uh, the building uh, assuming it's um, you know a, a organized in a very efficient way which it would be uh, would reduce the envelope exterior costs of the building so um, yeah we would uh, need to look carefully at that but I my sense, you know, is that it would reduce the cost. So, so just to follow up on that, okay. you had the, you know, my thumbnail was 50 to 60 million for the re renovation of both of them approximately, mm -hmm. not including the senior center. And then a complete replace you had at 60 to 80 million dollars. Mm -hmm. When you say it's going to go down, are we talking tens of millions or? What kind uh, of percentage? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just want to get a. I mean, I know that it's not. Yeah, a, um, I would venture to say it's you know ten or fifteen percent okay. somewhere in there. I, but um, don't hold me to it. It's <laughs> one of those things where we like to study uh, scenarios like that. You know, and it depends a lot on the site. You know, you have a site where it has a well, mentioned a wetlands. You know, and. The foundation of building on that or an irregular shape site so um, we have an easy time uh, estimating costs when you assume a flat site and, <laughs> you know but those are hard to find so uh, every scenario is a little unique and um, as you get to the point of evaluating sites uh, we usually recommend doing some sort of test fit once a program is determined and kind of kick the tires to see really what those costs are because you can find there could be a lot of variation between sites in terms of the costs. I, I just want to follow up. I just have a couple of from my direction. Um, the feedback that I've gotten the most from the public has been a desire to increase the density of the recreational facilities and maybe more cultural amenities in where the pool and the library and the Chamber of Commerce are now. And I think that would maybe fall into line with option two, maybe a little better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that I've heard people who are, have kids that are a lot more into the sports have been pushing for the Joe Dancer, yeah. more sports type facility. Um, my preference is actually to have it more in the downtown core and maybe to be rethinking what we do with the Dragon Park in the downtown city park. but. My only thought is when I mentioned the airport is I don't know that the downtown will continue to be the downtown. Uh, there's a whole plan for what's going to happen out on Three Mile Lane that's in process at this point in time. And I think it's, you know, possibly putting it in an area where there's a lot of new stuff happening might be advantageous. And it also would give more focus on the airport too, yeah. which is something we've always wanted to do. If we can do it. <laughs> yeah, I think that, <clears throat> Sally, you're, I was, I was um, ple pleasantly surprised and excited at how many uh, responses we got are centered around c cultural arts and, mm -hmm. and cultural performing arts centers. Um, something I've always been excited by, but I'm glad that I'm not the only one. Um, and then in the back of my mind is as I'm, I'm, I'm very on board with option two of exploring new facilities for both of those options. The thing that I'm thinking a lot about is how do we reshuffle the deck with our existing facilities and can we, can we just offload those to something else to help fund some of these projects? Can we create some of those needs that we don't have on paper here yet we've also seen some excitement from the community around? How can we use those existing facilities without chewing up valuable downtown real estate or current downtown as part of a ABC downtown that we're creating in this spread out core. Um, so it, it's a lot to chew on and it's exciting. I think there's a, a lot to talk about in what's not mentioned here too. So um, I'm, I'm also on option two and, and excited to see what we can do with our existing facility. Adam? Uh, overall, most excited about option two, I guess 
with maybe option 2B being that we look at putting the library when you mentioned circulation went up 30% in that other municipality that was real exciting to me um, and definitely would be on board with exploring locating it out on Three Mile Lane um, and the possibility of incorporating a new fire facility but more than anything just aquatic library and community center and um, you know the fire I'd, I'm open to looking at that but I still think the fire would go better with its own standalone FBO type building and the fire needs to be um, located strategically which could really have an impact on uh, where the other places may be so uh, they they serve two different uh, entities and so uh, I just throw that out on the table that we ought to take a more broad look that because we're looking at uh, uh, we're looking at assets that we're gonna have to come up with money for in the long run altogether so yeah and, uh, if we were to put a facility up that house all three of those I'd definitely be on board with Zach and Sal and seeing that we could have some cultural arts still downtown and utilize some of our existing footprint and mm -hmm possibly selling off some of our footprint to fund this so our taxpayers aren't totally on the hook. Yeah, I'd love to come this. Other thoughts, Wendy? Yeah, um, I'm also of like mind that I feel like option two is the best option for us at this point. I think the senior center seems like it's functioning really well where it is. Uh, and um, I feel like there's a lot of economy of scale that we can gain from efficient design and and also you know one footprint, one foundation, one roof, one um, staffing um, concern once it's all uh, completed. I would like to see it stay closer to our existing downtown just because I feel like it's such a hub that it would be hard. I think it would be challenging for families to ha have to travel somewhere if it becomes a destination place. So. My mind goes to looking at how we can keep it as close as possible to where people are currently traveling so that it's a part, it flows into their daily life, like walking, biking. You know, I know right now kids bike to the library and things like that. I wouldn't want to lose that in this change. Right, exactly. So I, that's a strong priority for me that I feel like it needs to really flow with how the community moves right now. Although I think it's a great idea to think about what can go out in Three Mile Lane, but I'm not there's sure. always public transit too. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm I think that option two is our strongest option at this point, and I really uh, think it would be fun to look at what we could do with that, and and also to to look at how the existing facilities, what happens with them, and how they might be able to contribute to funding for whatever it is that we do. Yeah. A little. If I may add a little more. Um, additionally, um, I'd like to applaud any all of everyone that came before me for main, creating and maintaining for so long such great services as they were. I think reading this, it was the temptation was to think that holy cow, how have we offered such subpar service for so long? When I think in contrast, uh, that was the truth was in contrast to that. Uh, I know Adam and I, and I think everyone here has either raised kids or have been in, as kids through these halls, swimming in that pool, and done all those activities and had a great time. Thank you. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of shaping what that looks like. I also think at that same time, what I think a lot of is coming into play from some of the public opinion is, nostal is nostalgia. And I think nostalgia philosophically is more of a toxic impulse than a lot of creative impulse so moving away from old facilities and into new facilities is more is is that feeds my desire to do that um, additionally I think one thing that I wanted to bring up was our capacity for events here has been um, has taken up a lot of time effort and energy that I think is more of a ball and chain than it isn't I think our community and I was gonna ask Jeff while he was here has responded to a stated and research need for events and meeting space and and will continue to try to respond to that and I don't want to undercut that our business and community's ability to, to, to fill that need um, and offer it better and more cost-effective than we can I think we should focus on core services which was events were very low and stated on the list so I'd like to shutter our notion of can, can housing and hosting events in whatever we do um, and I think I'd like to hear 
both Jeff and Susan's opinion on events specifically and where we're going. And I'd like to hear the council's and our cons consultants' opinions on if we're all feeling comfortable with option two and nothing stands in our way, what's a, what's a rough timeline roadmap for essentially groundbreaking? <laughs> Move right along here, Zach. <laughs> well, that's always the that's always the case. Um, Could I just get sure. my two cents? Yeah. In? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going for the two B. I, I, okay. I honestly I don't think the senior center should necessarily be incorporated into this, but I definitely think a library or possibly a satellite fire station might be a, a good idea. And I, you know, if we did it in town, I guess probably Joe Dancer might be one of the better places to go. I don't personally think the downtown park facility is a good one because it's, there's just too much transportation in and out and it's difficult. Even though it's been greatly improved, I just think it would be congestion. Mm -hmm. and, and then I'm just gonna throw one other piece in. I really enjoy the thought process of, of um, if we were in the downtown of eliminating the, uh, Aquatic Center and, and incorporating some of the park there. I think we've got a, 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 a park that's a part of that. But I also throw out the thought of out by the Senior Center with Wortman Park. That's a big park. We've got a lot, a lot of, I think, sometimes unused space out there that we could, and that's in the northeast part of town, uh, close to the high school, middle school. Uh, so that's is probably as close to downtown as you can get Flat without. Too. Yes. So uh, again, just a thought. We've got assets there that we possibly could take a look at. But so back to Ken. Yeah. Well, and I'll let Jim add on to this too. I mean, in an absolutely perfect world, which we're not in, um, is what? Yeah. <laughs> you're a minimum of everything went clockwork three years away from opening the door, realistically, probably more like five, from the time that you would move forward and do all the due diligence. To be honest with you, we're gonna give you a direction coming out of this of what you need to do, but there's gonna be a lot more work to be done beyond just the contract that we have here to really to say, okay, if we wanna implement this, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You have to obviously have the funding piece of this in place, that, that, that takes time. Uh, you know, Jim, you're a year on just design right. and construction that's probably 16, uh, yeah, 16 months or maybe 18 months depending. Uh, but yeah, finding the, the site, it seems like the biggest One of the biggest challenge. questions. One of, it's a big question and that takes some time and, you know, uh, potentially resources. So yeah, I, I would say a minimum three years. But, we got mo but there's momentum, so, you know, yeah. see where it goes. I think from our standpoint, um, if there's consensus from yeah. council that you like option 2B, two, two and I think that's fair, uh, we, that's kind of what we were looking for. That gives us an idea of where to move, and the 2B being can we or at least look at opportunities to integrate the library, great concept. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think any of us, uh, there's any heartburn on that. I mean, be honest with you, if, if there's agreement from you all up there, that that's what we're looking for uh, this evening, and any other things you want to add to it's fine. Well, one thing I'd like to do is, uh, Jeff, for you to weigh in a little bit. Sure. From, from a staff perspective, and then possibly Susan, uh, uh, you guys live in this stuff day in and day out, and Jeff manages it. So just, I'd, I'd like to hear your opinions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Zach just took it as a personal challenge to have you not. Be quiet when the <laughs> <session. laughs> uh, So I think that I, I, I like a lot of what I heard tonight. I think um, evaluating a new or emerging neighborhood like Three Mile Lane has some value. There are trade-offs in terms of transportation and proximity, and that's probably always going to be on the edge of what McMinnville looks like for a very long time. Um, we, we own and control some properties in and around the downtown area that could make property assembly a little bit easier. When we talk about potential partners and equity uh, partners, one that we haven't talked about yet is Linfield College. 
and I think the kind of conversation we had tonight would give me the freedom to say to the consultant team and the President Davis, is there something that we can talk about that feels like a, mm -hmm. you know, a downtown slash and field proximate mm -hmm. aspect? I, I think that combining some number of patron-centered facilities won't serve all of the community's needs, and it doesn't have to. Um, you could potentially have a site that incorporates an awful lot of what you've seen and create capacity in the community and the organization to infuse cultural assets someplace else. Mm -hmm. Maybe cultural assets at Joe Dancer Park or prohibitive based on sort of the, real, the, the reality of geography and geology that exists, but maybe a flat Wortman Park next to another patron service like Senior Center would be a place for a performing arts center that we hadn't really thought of before. We sort of gravitate towards Lower City Park and Joe Dancer for obvious reasons, and, and those may be good sites as well. So I, I think two or three or four big bubbly kind of areas where we would be able to study which of these pieces fit together, uh, and then ultimately there would be a series of community conversations about what trade-offs you're willing to make, because one site might accommodate uses A, B, and C, and other might C, D, and E, and which one is better, maybe both work great, you just have to pick one and go with it at some point. Uh, my September is relatively open, I'm not committing to which year, but... <laughs> uh, the, what I would add to that is uh, each, each potential site has some a lot more work we need to look into it, not only from floodplain issues, but some of the facilities that we have built. For example, um, when we get a federal grant to build a facility or to make a park improvement, we are often required to put a deed restriction on the rest of the park saying it, can, it must stay in open space. So each layer and each level of, of the, these conversations that we go through will be our opportunity to kind of dig a little bit more and see, okay, what can we do at Upper City Park? What can we do at Wartman? What can we look at through all of these things? So I think this is a really great discussion. When I put the filter of the strategic plan on this whole conversation, which we do every day, and it's, it's fantastic because almost every strategic initiative you have, a priority you have in there applies to this conversation. Um, I think about the core services a lot and related to particularly what you said, Zach, and, and meeting space. Um, and the term nostalgic use is really, I think, very relevant here. Um, I think that this building is large um, for what we need. It has a lot of spaces that aren't really programmable for what our core services are in recreation. And so by necessity and as an alternative um, revenue source, we've worked hard at getting them ready for and keeping them going as rental spaces, but it really does pull on our staff. It really does pull on the facility, and um, we, we do a lot of things in Park and Rec, and again, you're gonna hear this from me next week, at dirt bot rock bottom prices in order to try and get more people in the building or get more use of it, and we do end up undercutting people, and, and I, I do struggle with, is that really a core service of Parks and Recreation, or should we really be focusing on some of those things that we haven't been able to do yet? You heard the team talk about inclusion services and equity and inclusion. There, we, we are chomping at the bit to do more of that within our recreation programs, and we don't have the resources and energy to do that a lot of the time because we're running around trying to make um, rooms ready for things or try and bring more revenue in for that reason. And, um, and so I, I really look at it through that lens, and I think we would be able to focus on those other things that our community expects of us a lot more if we had a little less space and a little less uh, of that marketing that we try to do for those space rentals. And we also know it's very important in our community and people are very connected with it. So I think that's a part of our community dialogue going forward is how do we transition that and identify resources. And as Jeff mentioned, we've opened the door for a lot of those conversations with Chemeketa about their rental spaces and how we can start pointing people towards other opportunity um, and, and other opportunities and other spaces for those kinds of uses and just continuing to have that dialogue about where, where do we make sure these things are happening in our, in our resources for our community while we as a city and as a Parks and Recreation Department, we focus on those core services that our community expects that they want and that we deliver them at the high level that we are expected to deliver them at. And we're not quite able to hit that mark in these facilities. So we're looking, we, as a team, we are really looking forward to that opportunity to be able to envision that with you and the community and think about charting that path and then, and then moving on that. So it's an exciting time. 
Okay, any last comments from council or everyone's been heard? Uh, Susan, you feel like you have a direction from tonight. Jeff, do you feel like you have a sense? And then Ken and, uh, and uh, Jim and Cindy, you feel comfortable in the discussions we've had? Very much so. Very much so. Ken, question? I was allowed to ask a question. That'd be fine. Uh, clear, uh, a clarification question on the pool facility and the pool facility cost. Um, when you were looking at renovating the pool, um, are you talking about keeping the, the uh, existing 25-yard and 20-yard pool and rehabbing that versus is new uh, looking at basically a doubling of the area, which is the new trend of having a lap pool, competitive pool, and a splash pool with all the current type, you know, river currents and shallow water stuff and slides, because that's almost double the, the square footage than what we have in the existing. So that's the first part of it. And then the other is, if we're looking at just doing rehab on the existing pool, can there be a 1.5 where we re renovate the existing pool and add a new community center to that? Mm -hmm. Which is so, Yeah, I think the, um, when we did the comparison of renovation versus new, it was, again, very rough order of magnitude and saying if you built that same square footage today in a new structure, what would it be? It wasn't taking the next step, which is what you're suggesting. What What is the mix of aquatics? Is, uh, is it a lap pull, 25 yard or 25 yard stretch? Is it eight lanes? And uh, a lot of decisions around just the lap pull. But then uh, I, I would think if you're planning a new Aquatics facility would include the warm water pool with the features you're referring to, and there's a lot of variations to that. But uh, this was just simply an accounting of saying new versus uh, existing, um, what is the direct cost, but not into the programming of it yet. Um, Sorry, the, the, the other part of the question. Um, and that sort of led to the, like, what's so my 1.5 would be right. renovating the existing pool. Oh, yes, adding, on the site. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the site is a challenging one. Um, as I mentioned, uh, just the aspect of parking, uh, to take the aquatic center and then add on to it as a, with the community center function. Um, from what we could tell, this site is just uh, way undersized and uh, you know, you wouldn't have adequate parking unless you started to, you know, pave over part of the park. It's a beautiful park, so I, we don't really think it's, the site has the capacity uh, to increase the square footage. We're even concerned if you were to add a, a large leisure pool onto it, um, would you have enough parking? There's, it's a limitation right now, so that's it. Thank you. Susan, you had another comment. I did just want to say one thing. I really appreciate the conversation about mixing the city facilities as well in the library and fire department and thinking about those facilities. Um, we have had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations at your executive leadership team level at the city, and we are very excited about that. And I think this um, direction and this consensus mm -hmm. from the council will just spur those uh, creative conversations even more so. So thank you for that. We have had some conversations, and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, for the very first time, we have a big picture of the needs that we have over these next five to ten years when it comes to facilities mm -hmm. and if we're talking about a piece of the facilities we ought to bring and take a look at the total uh, the total uh, opportunities there any other questions from council uh, I think we've got a direction and it is just the beginning of a process isn't it absolutely and we appreciate very much the time and the dialogue tonight. This is absolutely what we were looking for, and I hope it's been helpful to you all as well to understand kind of what got us to this point. Yeah. Well, Ken and group, thank you so very much. It just seemed like we had our conversation a week or two ago. I know it's been much longer than that, but we're moving quickly to this point mm -hmm. so that we can have the, the individuals and the dialogue to take, take hold and, and give us some direction. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, with that, we will go ahead. It's uh, we did that in two hours, you guys. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, dismiss our adjourn our meeting this evening. Thank you.